Welcome to this evening's cultural events lecture. And uh, I'd like to welcome Antonio Gomez Palacio. Uh, I've known Antonio for longer than either of us care to admit. Uh, I have the pleasure of running into him on a fairly regular basis, usually going on different escalators, going the opposite way at conferences. And every time we say, we've got to get into Winnipeg, and we find I have. <laughs> so I'm very pleased about that. Um, he's been working for the last few years on this idea of well-being and, and urban built environments. Um, and it's a, a topic that's becoming very important to us in all of the professions, uh, particularly over the last few years. So I'm very pleased that he's able to come today and, and talk to us about it. Um, I've known Antonio since we were both students at York University. Um, and I've sort of been able to follow his career and see him at various points in his different professional endeavors. Office of urbanism or office for urbanism. urbanism? See, you know, I, the preposition always caught me out. So from his early days as a small-ish, um, cutting-edge urbanist practitioner to becoming the founding partner, one of the founding partners of Dialogue, which most of you know is a fairly large concern across the country. It's one of Canada's, according to his bio, one of Canada's leading design firms. Very modest of you. Yes. <laughs> He's internationally recognized for transforming cities into vibrant urban places, which respond to their social, economic, and environmental and political contexts. Grounded in both a participatory and an evidence-based approach, his work is credited with meaningfully improving the well-being of communities. He's worked with a wide range of projects focused on urban intensification, master planning, mixed use, transit, heritage, economic development, and sustainability. And some of you may know he's one of the lead designers for the work that's going on around the university in the Southlands, Southlands Golf Course area and, and the precinct that's around the university and the new university plan. He's also acted as chair of the Toronto Society of Architects and the Vaughan Design Review Panel and is involved with a number of industry initiatives and organizations, including the Canadian Institute of Planners, Canadian Urbanism, and is a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Uh, please join me in welcoming Antonio. Thank you, Richard. So the, the last time that I was in this room speaking or participating with a group, Richard, you will remember we were having a uh, an indigenous uh, yes. workshop, three days, and this was in the context of doing the University of Manitoba campus master plan. And you know, I approached Richard and we said, you know, we really want to have a host of conversation. And you know, we we're thinking of a half-day workshop, but Richard, being who he is, my half-day workshop became a three-day symposium. It was awesome. <laughs> um, I want to start. The conversation today and, and uh, heads up I have a handful of slides we'll, which will just kind of depress everybody make you feel horrible but hopefully from there we'll kind of bring it back up again but my first slide I, I, I absolutely love this is my great-grandmother isn't she lovely um, I start with this slide partially because I love the photograph but also this image was taken exactly 100 years ago so picture, picture this. What was happening in the world 100 years ago? So that's my great-grandmother. That's my grandmother. That's my mom. All three of them, and my mom still lives in Mexico City. This is what Mexico City looked like exactly 100 years ago. Look at it. It's got transit. This is in the middle of the revolution. I live in Toronto. This is what Toronto looked like a hundred years ago. So why am I talking about these things? If anybody in this room was to die a hundred years ago, sorry, but if anybody in this room was to die a hundred years ago, in all likelihood, all of us would have died of, of an infectious disease. You know, forget about coronavirus right now, but we would have picked up tuberculosis or we would have picked up something along the way, and an infectious disease would have been the cause of our death. Hence, planning and cities, and this is what they were fighting at that time. Segregation of land uses, all of these things were trying to fight um, um, infectious diseases. 
Today, though, if anybody in this room was to die, 10 top causes of death are all chronic diseases. It's lifestyle choices. If you exercise, where do you live? If, what do you eat? The types of things that you do on a daily basis affect that. Yet we continue to plan our cities, we continue to build environments as if the problems that we were trying to solve were the same problems from 100 years ago. Think about that. And in fact, um, just look at premature deaths. So this is not somebody who's arrived their full life uh, end span, but premature deaths. 60% of the cause of premature death have everything to do with behavior, lifestyle, environment. Only 40% is genetics, healthcare, the types of things that we usually think about that relate to health. The tragic part is 96% of our healthcare money, of our public resources, goes to that 40%. We're only spending 4% of our resources on the preventative side, on the side of things that has to do with what is 60% of premature deaths. That doesn't seem right. So, which of these two apples would you bite into? Super clear. Like, we've got millions of years of genetic disposition to tell us exactly which of these two apples is the one that is going to contribute to our health and well-being, right? Which of these two environments contributes to our health and well-being? Which one would you pick? We kind of think that it's the one on the left, but it's the one on the right that we're building, right? We're building cities of rotten apples. We're building environments that are not contributing to our health. And, and our genetics are confused because we don't have the genetics to tell us, you know, how cities work and contribute to our health. Right? We're at that moment when we really need to be thinking about that. And of course, it's not just us. I tried to track exactly where Winnipeg is on the planet, and I think I got the Faculty of Ar Architecture just right. But we are at the stage already where the impact that we're having on the world is no longer renewable, right? We're consuming more planets than what we're able to renew on a yearly basis. And this issue is getting further and further compounded with um, growing world population. And in fact, it's increasingly an urban issue. We've surpassed worldwide the place where we are living, more people are living in cities than otherwise. And pick any indicator. Um, childhood obesity, it's becoming more and more critical in the different uh, income and demographics. And of course, not unrelated, the cost of healthy food is becoming a greater component of household incomes. It's becoming more and more expensive to eat healthy. Congestion in every city is increasing. The incidence of extreme weather events is increasing in every environment. And we see that that is having a huge impact on world refugees. The majority of world refugees are environmental refugees, not just coming from, from um, uh, uh, violence or economic refugees. Have I depressed you enough? Is that like now really getting to you? Of course, all of this creates that sense that the world is at an end, and unfortunately, most of us translate that into paralysis. We do nothing, right? It's an issue that is bigger than myself, it's bigger, it's out there, and there's nothing that I can do in my little project, in my little world, in my little workspace, in my household, there's very little that I can do. But my hope is this little smoker um, standing right there. Right? And I'll tell you why that smoker is my hope. Because with smoking, we were able to establish a causal link between a behavior and a health outcome. And therefore, we were able to establish policies and funding and all kinds of things to follow that. Right? That's great. We were able to see how lifestyle choices affect health and therefore we can start to create, do something about it. Of course, the next thing that we're doing that with is sedentary behavior. You've all been reading, you know, get out and exercise more and all of these kinds of things because a behavior is now being linked to all kinds of health outcomes, meaning we can now start to relate 
policies and built environment and do all these kinds of things. So we're starting to understand the relationship between physical health and active lifestyles. Great. But now think about all the other components of well-being. Mental health, social well-being, all the different areas where we're only, frankly, only scratching the surface. So as an example, uh, an estimate simply of sedentary behaviors cost to Canadian economy. It's almost $10 billion, right? That's a huge percentage of just the healthcare budget alone, $10 billion. The recent publication from KMH, $50 billion is the cost of mental health to Canadians' economy, right? And if you think mental health is not something that you know, I relate to, or you know, it's not about me. 40% of, um, sorry, more than half of Canadians by the age of 40 will have had a mental health um, incident or issue to deal with. That's huge. That's half of this room. Well, mental health will be a concern and an issue. We need to be thinking about that. We can't be sweeping it under the road, un under the rug. And of course, health and well-being continues to be a rising cost um, in every single province. Um, as the economy continues, this is only increasing. So again, 100, 200 years ago, planners were actually dealing with these things, right? We were segregating land uses, we were green garden movement, all of these kinds of things. We're dealing with uh, infectious diseases and polluting environments and toxins and health was at the forefront of urban planning. In some areas of the world, it also is the case today. The United Nations has indicators around health and well-being, and they're awesome. Uh, they're looking at a lot of environments where the issues they're dealing with are access to water, access to sewage, you know, these kinds of issues. And in Canada, there's environments where that is really the issue. But in many regards, for most urban environments in Canada, we need to be thinking beyond those, those elements. City of Vancouver, is anyone familiar with this report? The vital signs report the City of Vancouver publishes? So they have indicators and metrics on how we can really start to design and plan the city to contribute to health and well-being. And they're great, but they're dealing with things like uh, voter turnouts or high school dropout rates, which are really important. But it's really hard for an architect, an urban planner, an urban designer, an engineer, to actually know how to affect high school dropout rates, right, or voter turnout rates. Uh, one of the, the indicators that they have here, which I think is awesome, is sense of belonging, and we'll speak about that in a minute. But they actually go out every year and ask people, so how's our sense of belonging doing? And metrics they measure there is um, rates of volunteerism, or how many of your neighbors could you call in an emergency? Like these kinds of things um, are, are really interesting. There's also a lot of projects that are now really starting to embed health and well-being as a core aspect of their project. Not surprisingly, in Vancouver, this is Pearson Dogwood, a project that is really kind of building on that. But if you just start to track the number of publications that are correlating health and well-being in the built environment, it, it, it's kind of on an upward curve, right? This is a topic that is becoming of increased interest in every field that you look at. And that's great. We're starting to understand it. We're starting to look at it. But in my mind, it's a little bit of where the conversation was on sustainability when you and I were going to school, right? Is great idea. We had no idea what we were talking about. That's where health and well-being is right now. Great idea, but frankly, you know, we're only starting to understand what, what we're talking about. And we still inhabit that cognitive dissonance of the problem is bigger than me and I don't know how to do, uh, what to do about it and therefore I ignore it. And we're definitely in that space where we're spending all of our resources downstream, dealing now with the consequences and very little upstream, really understanding how do we deal with preparing ourselves for it and really um, understanding from the proactive side of things. The good news is that's where architecture, that's where planning, that's where urban design, that's where landscape, that's where city building has a real opportunity. 
enough of a problem? How do we start to embrace this as an issue then? This was a, an, an issue that we as an organization kind of confronted and, and we decided to make this our mission statement, right? Meaningfully improving the well-being of communities. But the next day when we sobered up after adopting this, we realized, frankly, we didn't know what we were talking about. What is community well-being? How do you know that you're meaningfully improving it? What does the community have to say about this? Right? So we launched a, a research exercise and we teamed up with Conference Board of Canada and Ceres, the Centre for Research on Disabilities out of Quebec and a number of different organizations to really come to understand how do we bring uh, better evidence and better knowledge into understanding this, this problem. So what do you do? Well, you start reading everything you can get your hands on, right? So our, our um, literature review included over 3,000 pieces of literature. And then we started to talk to anybody that would talk to us. City officials and chief medical officers and practitioners and um, people out in the field and many different environments. And we started to realize that there was a couple of big gaps. If you're a chief medical officer, ooh, you've got tons of indicators. You know exactly what are the things that you need to be looking at. But if you're one of these disciplines, if you're a mechanical engineer or an architect or a landscape architect, it's actually really hard to know how you contribute. Because if I just tell you, go out and reduce obesity rates, what are you going to do? You're going to look up an article on the internet and like go and try and build more bike trails. It's really hard to know what to do. So there was a gap in knowledge around these disciplines. And then there was also a gap in knowledge around these scales. Because much of the data is collected by Census Canada and they do it by their census track. And, um, but if you're working on a project, a building, a park, that's not the scale at which much of the data is collected, right? And certainly you can't wait five years till the next time the data is collected to figure out if the, the park was successful, if it did what was intended to do. So we identified there was two big gaps. What does the people in this room do and how can we do it in the projects that we're working in? The first six months of the whole research was dedicated to even understanding what the definition is. What does community well-being mean? And this is the definition that we ended up adopting. And this is in fact the definition that is now being adopted by New Zealand as a country. Every policy that comes to, um, to the federal government gets measured against their ability to deliver on, on, this, on, this, um, on this premise. But I'll highlight a couple of things for you. You're all familiar with the triple bottom line, yeah? Environmental, economic, social. Sometimes they'll throw cultural in there. Something fascinating in this definition is the world political. That means that the voices around the table who participates in the conversation matters. Process matters. This is so important that it actually gets re-emphasized in the second part of the conversation. Individuals, communities need to be part of this conversation. Think about that. As soon as we adopted this definition, it meant that this was no longer going to be a set of standards, a set of prescribed outcomes. It meant that it had to be a way of understanding and it had to be about a process and it had to be about engaging with individuals and communities. It had to be more a way of thinking than it had to be a way of prescribing a design or a plan. So woohoo, we had a definition. We had five domains. The next step was really to start to think about what are some of the indicators and what are some of the metrics by which we can start to bring evidence and analyze and inform some of those conversations. So this is what I'll do now. I'll walk you through some of those, those indicators. We also tested it out in a couple of, of case studies. So this is Durham Regional Police. It was one case study. We just went in and we measured everything and we really tried to understand it to test some of those indicators. But I'll use it as a backdrop to speaking to the social domain. So in the social domain, the first indicator is welcoming. Clearly, if we are not creating an environment that is welcoming to everybody, regardless of background, of age, of income, of abilities, if we haven't understood at the beginning of the project 
how do we create a truly welcoming environment? We're not going to be contributing to community well-being. And it's incredible how many projects start by never asking the question, who are we trying to make this welcoming for? Right? Imagine if this was one of the starting questions at every single project. Second indicator, support systems. You know, is the project building the support systems that people need in order to fulfill the activities of their everyday life? You know, maybe people need access to healthy food, to recreation, to a daycare. We need to be asking this question. We will never know unless we ask the question and then we start to have those conversations that lead into that. This third indicator, socialization. You know, frankly, I always knew socialization was important. I had no idea. You can push early onset dementia and Alzheimer's if people have great spaces to socialize. Reduce the rates of suicidal teenagers through spaces of socialization. Uh, increase quality of life. The amount of things and the positive effects. So, you know, I behoove every one of you and every one of your projects to be thinking about how am I going to create great door, indoor, outdoor spaces for socialization? Because the impact that it has on health and well-being, and especially on mental health, is tremendous. Second case study was the, the banks. This is a residential project, also very, very different. But I'll use it as a backdrop for the environmental one. The first indicator is delight and enjoyment. Think about it. If people don't actually enjoy their spaces, if they don't gain um, joy from, uh, from their spaces, it's not going to contribute to their health and well-being. So one of the metrics here is biophilia, right? Views to nature. We know that we can significantly increase quality of life for people who have views to nature. So one of the, the metrics there suggests that you know, we can actually measure places where you have views to nature where you're spending more than four hours a day. Great. You know, these things we can actually go out and contribute and make sure that projects, be it a large scale neighborhood plan or an indoor renovation, we can be thinking about these environments. Second one is, of course, natural systems the health of all the systems that support life. Water, energy, carbon, greenhouse gases, right? We need to be thinking about these, all of these systems because they, in turn, support the health and well-being of, of, of individuals. Third one is mobility. And this is one of the ones that has received the most attention in the literature, right? Reduced car dependency and active lifestyles. And if this is all there was, you know, we wouldn't have had to do all of this research. That's a really important one. Um, but it, it ought not to end just on the mobility side of things. The fourth one here is resilience. And I want you to think about resilience in the broadest way possible. Because most, most of our minds, when we talk about resilience, we're thinking about climate change, climate adaptation, right? But think about resilience as, are we prepared to really embrace the changes that are coming in front of us, right? And I'll give you an example. Everybody in this room, as far as I know, is aging. Do you live in an environment that is really prepared to age in place? No, why? Because we ignore that, right? Oh, too big. I don't want to be thinking about those things, right? We're facing changes. We're aging. Changes in demographics, changes in economics, changes in technology. There's an incredible amount of changes that are coming in front of our lives, very little of which has actually informed our design and our planning process. So at the beginning of a project, we need to understand what are the changes that any given community is facing, and then actually figure out how they're going to be better and bolder at the other end of those changes. Third domain is the economic one. And the first indicator there is affordability. And again, most, most of our minds goes to housing when we talk about affordability, right? But I'll invite you to be thinking about all aspects of what makes an affordable lifestyle. And I'll give you examples. The average Canadian spends 17% of their household income on housing. But they spend 14% on transportation. Think about it, 17, 14. If we can create an environment where people can live without a car, 
I've just liberated 14% of their disposable income that they can put to housing or anything else. The whole affordable housing conundrum is a different conversation. If I can actually reduce and create affordable transportation, affordable access to recreation, affordable access to healthy food, affordable access to health care, to education, we need to be thinking about all aspects of what a household income is and how am I actually creating those. And every one of your projects has the ability to really be thinking about those things. Second indicator is complete communities. And this is the idea that scale matters. If I can do all of those things within walking distance, it matters. If I can get you know, to the proverbial uh, bag of milk and within walking distance, that matters. Right? But if scale matters, time also matters. I need to be thinking about the full life cycle of things. Right? Not just doing a project on the economics of day one, but what is this like 10, 20, 40, 50 years from today? Right? There's something amazing about the buildings in the downtown that have actually gone through huge amount of cycles in terms of the use and the users and everything, right? They're very resilient, they're adaptable. The same embodied energy in some of those buildings has actually served many, many different purposes. We need to be thinking about how these projects, these investments that we're making, actually survive over time. The fourth one is the local economy, because we know that one of the social determinants of health is income levels. If I can get the, the dollar that I'm spending within the community to spin around the community, right? Create opportunities for entrepreneurialism, hire local talent, get the local artists to be part of the project. You know, all of these things, if I can do live work units where now somebody can start a business from home, right? And create real opportunities for people to spur up the local economy, it's gonna have a huge impact on the health and well-being of the community. Fourth one is the cultural one. And uh, the first indicator there is access to cultural and recreational vitality. And I worked now some time ago on Winnipeg's downtown um, and culture plan, which was an awesome exercise. There's you know, access to the, uh, the Royal Ballet and the galleries and the big events. Sure, that matters. But think about all aspects about access to culture. And I'll give you an example. I was standing in the middle of the University of Saskatchewan and with an indigenous student. He's lived in the city his entire life. He must have been about 20 years old. And he tells me, there's nothing in the landscape, there's nothing in any of the buildings that I can point at where I can describe what my culture is like, that I can tell to you what my culture is. I don't relate to anything that I can see. Live there his entire city. What does that mean to access to culture? What does that mean in terms of the vitality of that individual, let alone a whole segment of society? In every one of our projects, we need to be asking, what does it mean to create access to culture? How do we convey culture? How do we communicate? How do we build an environment where there's real cultural vitality? Again, it's not just gonna be the big institutions. There's many, many different ways that we need to be thinking about it. Remember that indicator that Vancouver measures, sense of belonging? That's huge, right? Culture is a big aspect of it, but there's many other aspects that are, are a huge part of that, right? And we really need to be thinking about even rates of volunteerism. We know that communities with high rates of volunteerism have a much stronger resilience to change, um, senior isolation is reduced, all kinds of mental health benefits emerge out of it, has a huge impact. We need to be thinking about those elements. This is one of my uh, favorite ones, play, and it's incredible how the literature has really expanded on the connections between mental health and play. And this is not just kids, it's all of us. The ability for us to engage with the world creatively has a huge positive effect. So think about it in your projects. How am I actually gonna create an environment where people can and ought to play and are encouraged to play? The fourth one is learning. Clearly, learning matters. And this is not just lifelong learning, right? The ability to learn over time. 
This is the notion that people need to understand why we're doing all this. Because if I just go around and you know, wag my finger and say, thy shall lead active lifestyles, eh, who cares? But if you get it, if you understand all of this, you're much greater, uh, you're, you're more likely to have a positive effect in all of this, right? So building the awareness campaigns, getting people involved, really generating the capacity building along with a project has the potential to have a really um, important aspect in it. Fifth one is the political. And uh, yes, we were doing public engagement once and this was at the end of a, um, uh, the ferry terminal in Toronto and of course Batman and the Joker came over from taking photos with tourists and enjoying our, our uh, public engagement. What I won't describe is we were handing out uh, lemonade. It was a really, really hot day. Turned out that this was the end of the naked bike ride. I'm not going to show you those photos. Anyway, the, the political one is, you know, was this an integrated process? Did we actually have a, a variety of perspectives around the table day one, right? Or did we only call up on the community leaders and the residents at the end? The landscape architect called them all the way at the end. Did we have all of these voices at the table from the beginning? And just because at the table, it doesn't mean that they were necessarily collaborating, right? So did we have a collaborative process? Did we create environments where people could feel like they could participate in a safe way, in a way that where their input was really meaningful? Because all of these things are huge to create that one, right? Which is a sense of ownership and stewardship. And think about this one in particular. And I'll give you an example. In our penal system, as a society, we've decided that one way to treat inmates is to take away their ability to manipulate their space, right? Paint the walls, hang pictures, like do all these kinds of things because we're trying to penalize them. In your house, you can do all of those kinds of things, right? You can change the furniture, uh, manipulate, be a steward of your own environment. Now think of how we treat the public realm. Do we allow people to change up a sidewalk, a park, a, an environment? We actually treat our public realm in the same way that we treat our prisons. We treat our citizens in the same way as we treat prisoners. Does that make sense? We're not actually embedding a sense of stewardship and ownership with folks through how we plan and design our communities. We need to be thinking, and what does that do to their health and well-being? Right? We need to be thinking about that. We need to be thinking about how do we build that into our projects. So now you're thinking, okay, what the hell do I do with all of this? Right? How do I bring this into what I'm doing in my school project, my, my community, the park that I was trying to think about? Well, frankly, it just starts with a conversation. Right? This is uh, Greg. I think you might actually be in this photograph somewhere. So this is a project in, in Ottawa, right? And I love this one because the local councillor is trying to explain community well-being and you see the kind of the circle there. You see all of these conversations taking, taking place. Uh, and frankly, that's resulted in, in a plan and a design and, and really building out the concept of how do you create the park? How do you create the residences? How do you create a mix of uses? And it started with a conversation with the residents. This one is in Kingston. The city of Kingston, a whole new neighborhood park. Again, really getting all the different voices around the table and asking, how are we going to create a sense of belonging? Increased rates of volunteerism. How is um, a sense of uh, stewardship really going to be brought into this project? And we literally had community members go out and fill every one of those indicators and contribute ideas and think about it. Right? And it's fascinating when you flip the conversation on its head and, and really talk about what matters, what's going to have a positive impact, then the plan that comes out of that. This one's in Vancouver, a uh, community college, Vancouver Community College, thinking about how are we going to create learning environments that truly contribute to health and well-being. So the, the um, Broadway and the downtown campus, how can you start to redesign the entire facilities for a community college if you're going to put, not getting a, your image in a flashy architecture magazine or you know, just meeting with a zoning bylaw, how are we going to 
create environments that truly put well-being at the forefront. So I want to end a little bit where I started. You know, the photos of great-grandma, grandma, my mom, an older photograph of myself. But I don't want you to be thinking about 100 years ago, and frankly, I don't want you to be thinking about today. I'm hoping you can start thinking about the next 100 years. So that's my kid. Um, how do we actually think about the environments that we're going to be building, that are going to be contributing to the health and well-being for the next 100 years? So if anybody wants a copy of the, the report that was published by the conference board, it's there. But I'll end here and open it up to see if anyone has comments or thoughts. Thank you. Questions, comments, thoughts? And maybe we can get the lights on. Greg, go for it. There's a, there's a microphone coming your way. No, that's okay. I can speak loudly. So I, this was a great presentation, and I participated with uh, with Antonio in a couple of big projects, one in Ottawa. And it, it's a great model. It brings people together. The people who are most noticeably absent from the discussion were the 20,000 people who are going to come and live in this community in the future. And there is actually a movement in the United States by a couple of people who are going around to council meetings trying to represent those people who will be the future members of this community who were nowhere in sight at the time of the discussion about what the community is going to look like. How do you propose to have those people who will be, you know, soon to be the majority element of this community of the future, how do you propose to represent their best interests through the process you described? Yeah, so, so Greg asks a really important question, right, is how do you bring the voices that are not present at the time into the conversation, right? And there's many voices, future residents, right? People who haven't been born yet. Um, but also there's people who may not uh, be able to participate, right? Language barriers or other kinds of barriers as well, right? So sometimes you can get uh, the voices who can represent those voices, but a huge aspect of the framework is bringing some of that knowledge base that is about understanding, you know, how are we creating environments that are good for everybody? Um, but it is absolutely a huge challenge, right? Is how do we put our minds and our shoes in the footsteps of people who are now going to be coming into the next generation and the next one and the next one after that? So hence the challenge of planning not for the needs of today, but the community from 100 years from today. Greg, by the way, is running an open house tomorrow. I'll do a little bit of a plug for, for the open house um, related to the campus plan for the university, but also the development of all the endowment plans. So go and bug him afterwards. Any other thoughts, questions? So if no one else is going to jump in, I am. OK. <laughs> so it's a related question in a way. And um, it goes back actually to a presentation that one of your colleagues made at CIP a couple of years ago about participation. And so you're in a position as a private sector planner yeah. that you're, you tend to be, by the nature of practice, project based. Yeah, yeah and sometimes projects are policies or whatever. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but you know, if you, you, this looks like a great tool for participation. Yes. But, the, but it's for participation towards a point. How do you make it into an ongoing participation tool? How do you get a community to take it on board as something that they can use as they govern, dwell, inhabit, and, and change their environments? We talked about people changing their environments. How do you get this sort of thinking into their thinking when they're, as they're engaging with their own environments? Oh, really important one, right? So the the whole research and the publication of this material was very intentionally um, made with the idea of being accessible. So all the language is very accessible and the likes. But we've actually kept zero intellectual property on any of it. It's published so that anybody can use it. And, and the tools are all available for anybody to use. So we've now been getting um, emails and news stories of you know, a community somewhere 
out, um, downloaded it and started to use it and inform their thinking and they started to talk about things that they might not have talked otherwise. Our only request is tell us how it goes um, because we want to continue to improve upon it, right? But absolutely the intent is if this is only something that, you know, a small group of people can use because of expertise or licensing, um, it's not going to work. It's not actually going to change anything. It has to be something that any community, anybody can use. They don't need a tremendous amount of access. We wanted to put the burden of the research on the researcher, not on the community member, right? So the idea is anybody can use it and ought to be able to do that. And you're right. It's, um, it's just as much a, an exercise in guiding the design as it is in a communication tool. So how do you build in feedback loops? You design this, you say it's going to do these things. Yes. Then what? So I, ideally this gets implemented from, you know, I'm thinking about a project, I'm designing a project, I'm occupying it, and then the life of it, right? you should be asking those questions. And I'll point the finger to the very first one, right? Welcoming. Am I creating an environment? So I need to be thinking about, you know, how am I going to uh, create an environment that is welcoming? Then I need to have the conversations in the design process. But frankly, it's a question I need to be thinking about and asking during the entire life of the project. 10, 20 years later, I need to be monitoring these things because circumstances may change. Some things might be working, some things might not. So one of the aspects is a post-occupancy and a monitoring tool so that you can continue to do that. And our hope and, and strategy is um, resident condo boards and resident associations and BIAs and landlords um, can start to use that as much as the public sector, right? Um, neighborhood plans and all of the likes to continue to monitor these things. Because if it only informs one step in the process, it's only going to have a bit of an impact. If it really becomes a lifelong tool, it has a huge potential. So, projects are limited in terms of money. And yeah. Right? This is more, this is like a uh, tool to do community engagement and to put everything on, on a particular project according to their, to their beliefs, right? Uh, have you maybe the previous project, if, if projects before this, maybe this strategy takes longer, takes uh, maybe less time? Have you evaluated the economic aspects to your company of implementing that? Because sometimes I feel that these tools maybe take longer and you have to maybe overcharge other like, clients because of that, because like your things about money in a way. Yeah. And, and it's really important that if, in order to do this, it's going to cost more money, it's not going to work, right? This is more about influencing the way that we think about it, right? And I'll give you a, an example. Has anyone been to Petrolia? 5,000 people, town in the outskirts of Sarnia in, in Ontario. So a tiny little town. And, and they actually created a whole plan around how do they combine the hospital and the town for health and well-being and all these things. But in the middle of all of this, um, rates of volunteerism came up, right? This idea, and one of the, they had two big issues in town. One is the isolation of seniors, rural community, seniors, you know, stop going to their medical appointments and they kind of spiral out of control. And then the other is uh, teenagers who have nothing to do in town, um, poking their eyes out and trying to leave town as quickly as possible, right? So they decided to create a program where teenagers would drive seniors to the hospital, right? Volunteer program, they get credit in high school for driving the, the seniors, the seniors get out, they start to kind of create all kinds of positive things came out of it. You know, what was the cost of doing the program? Frankly, nothing, right? And this happened way in advance of any other big investment that came into play, right? And it all started simply by asking the question, acknowledging that communities that have high rates of volunteerism have great positive impact on things. The question got asked in the context of a community engagement, and then they started to run this program, 
right? So it, it ought not to cost money. It ought not to have an impact on how we do things. It ought to be about how do we actually influence the conversation. It costs just as much to build something wrong as it does to build it right. This is about bringing the right questions into the conversation and how can we start to frame it. And frankly, every community will find their own answers. Right? Worked with another community where they created a program with um, autistic children to shovel the sidewalks of uh, seniors who couldn't get out of the, their home in the middle of winter. Awesome. Like that was the solution that they found, right? Somewhat similar problems, but in this case, you know, a very particular demographics. Any other thoughts? Question? Go ahead. Um, this story experience in applying this, but I guess I have a couple questions. So one would be sort of contentious. So like, this seems very packaged in a very sort of inclusive, sort of nice way. The contention that sort of happens when these things unfold. So I'm wondering how that's, how you deal with that within this type of framework. And the other one that's sort of related, perhaps not, is the categories are fairly specified. So through applying this, have you actually found that other indicators of emerge that you didn't perceive. It's, it's sort of like, you know, like things emerge that you weren't really expecting. Um, so you go in with this, the structure of the conversation. So what about the emergence? And then how do you deal with that emergence of rethinking your framework? Yeah. You make it more living? Well, and, and, and that's the, you know, the tailoring of it. Um, absolutely. Like that's the whole idea. This is a starting point. And, and that's what it's intended to be. It's a way of introducing into the conversation questions that may not have been asked otherwise. Where different communities take it will be very different, right? And the priorities that any community has or gives will be very different. Uh, but, there, but there's some intentionality behind it, right? It's also about saying, okay, you may really care about those things. There's other questions that you need to be asking. And you may choose not to, you know, to ignore them, but you need to know that these things matter, right? The evidence and the, and the research tells us that these things matter, right? So, yes, um, and, and this is where some ways of thinking have really kind of resulted in checklists and prescribed outcomes. Um, and there's reasons why people might choose to get, you know, certifications and all of those reasons. Um, this is not about it. This is just filling a gap in the knowledge gaps that that exist, and how do we actually inform the conversation? And that really matters. Like, if, if a community is dealing with a particular issue, that's what they need to deal with, right? It also gives uh, a certain amount of license to, you know, those contentious meetings. Like, how many open houses have you walked in, and the only conversation is traffic and density? That's it, right? And we can say, yeah, great, let's talk about that. But let's also talk about biophilia. Let's talk about, you know, um, sense of belonging. Let's talk about these other things. And, and you can do enrich the conversation, right? So I'll ask, you know, a, lo a lot of folks in the room are, you know, going through a program of some sort and you know, you're doing planning or architecture or the likes, can you, can you imagine some of these questions being asked in the context of the projects that you're working on? Yeah, I see some nodding, maybe. Some emphatic nodding over there, yeah? Are you thinking about something? Always. Good. Good, good. Well, that's the intention, right? That, you, um, that some questions that might not have typically been asked can be raised in the context of the design process, the planning process, the community engagement, the approach with the city, with many of the different stakeholders. So I'll leave it at that. Um, linger around if anybody wants to chat, but thank you very much. <laughs>